Um, if you are between the ages of four and eight, you can leave uh, for a merge. The rest of us will be uh, in Habakkuk chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 19. As we finish up our study in Habakkuk uh, that we have done for the past several weeks. Uh, so if you, I invite you to turn there if you haven't already. Uh, since college basketball is starting this week, um, it's a wonderful time of the year, uh, a basketball illustration seems fitting. Uh, everybody seen, anybody seen the movie Hoosiers? Uh, and Hoosiers, that's a high school basketball team uh, from rural Hickory, Indiana. Uh, they go on this long winning streak. Um, there, there's only like four or five, there's only like five or six guys on the team anyways. They're not expected to win very many games. Uh, they go on this long winning streak. They play their way to the state championship game. Uh, the state championship game is played at Butler Fieldhouse in Indianapolis. There's a scene in the movie then when the team walks in. Uh, the coach brings his uh, team of, of small-town Hickory basketball players into Butler Fieldhouse, and it is uh, the largest arena they've ever played in. It is, will be the largest cl- uh, crowd they have ever played in front of, um, and you can see it on their faces. As they walk in, they've got this deer-in-the-headlights look. They look at the banners and the stands and kind of just wandering around looking at the immensity of Butler Fieldhouse. We're probably familiar with this sensation, even if you've never seen the movie. You've, you've got things that, that stick in your mind or in your, your memory, uh, places or sites that have caused you to, to stand in awe, uh, to watch in awe of what is before you. And as humans, our, our awe on earth uh, is but a shadow, though, of the awe that we feel when we will be face to face with God in eternity. Right? We, may, we may see the evidence of God's work now, but we think about some of the biblical characters that we've read growing up. We've, uh, there are some characters who have seen God. We, we can think about Isaiah, who was called up to the throne room of God, um, where, where God gives him his mission as, as a prophet. We can think about uh, the apostles as, as Jesus gives his final commission to them and ascends up into heaven, that they're standing there watching Jesus ascend up into heaven. The book of Habakkuk has been about faith in the midst of trial. And Habakkuk is going to end the book with a grand statement of, of his faith. But before we get to that, we have to see why Habakkuk has so much faith. We first see that Habakkuk stands in the awe of God. Habakkuk stands in awe of God. Let's read here in in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 15, and then we'll come back and do the rest of the the chapter um, in a little bit. Habakkuk writes, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigayanath. O Lord, I have heard the report of you. And your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from His hand, and there He veiled His power. Before Him went pestilence, and plague followed at His heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw tents of cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through. Through the earth in fury, you threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters." As Habakkuk closes his, his short book, he responds to God's taunts to the Babylonians with a psalm. If you'll remember last week, last week was this uh, series of taunts that God gives to the Babylonians in order to warn them of their evil and, and warn us uh, uh, of avoiding this evil that the Babylonians have fallen into. 
as Habakkuk responds, he writes this psalm. A psalm is, is just a song, um, and even that word at the, the beginning of, of verse 1. Oh, I flipped too many pages. Hold on. There it is. Uh, that, the word at the beginning of verse 1, the Shigayanoth, is just a word for a dirge, uh, where people acknowledge their utter dependence upon God. This song... It uh, was most likely set to music. Uh, we'll get to uh, the, the musical instructions at the end, but you can, you can skip down to verse 19 where it says to the choir master with stringed instruments, the design for this psalm was to be sung. Habakkuk writes this, and as he gets into it, he's addressing the God of the covenant. In verse 2, we see, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear we mentioned it, I don't think it was last week, but I think it was the week before, when you've got um, LORD in all caps, um, it is signifying Yahweh, this name that God gives to His people that is supposed to be a reminder that He is their God and they are His people, that He has made a covenant with the Israelites. Habakkuk is relying on this covenant, that, that or appealing to this covenant that God has made. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you. He has heard of the work that this God has done. Habakkuk has a close relationship with God, but he's also um, a good Jewish guy, right? And, and good Jewish men would know the stories that had happened through the Old Testament. They've been taught them from the time they were very young. Habakkuk is familiar with the Exodus. He's familiar with Abraham and Noah and the stories from the early books in the Old Testament. He knows what God has done. He says, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear? It says Habakkuk has seen what God has done, has seen the work that, that God has done throughout history, and he, he fears. This fear is not like, a, not like a Halloween fear, right? But an awe, a respect, a reverence, an understanding of the power and might of God. If this were the only thing that we were reading or have ever heard about God, this would beg the question, who is this God and, and what has this God done? Habakkuk then asks God to repeat it. Right, in the midst of years, it's just a, a long way of saying now, revive it. In the midst of years, make it known. Habakkuk looks at, at, at God and says, I've seen your work, I've heard what you've done, I know what you're about, and I fear, now do it again. Work again and again and again. Revive it. Make it known. Continue to work among us. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk is, is asking God to repeat the work that he's done. Uh, asking God to work again among his people. Uh, and then he's going to lay out this work that he wants from God. Starting in verse 3, we have a couple of places. God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now, these two places are, are, are places in Edom, E-D-O-M, uh, where, uh, and they're just referred to as Edom. Now, these, this verse in verse 3 is re referencing or, or taking us back to a couple of verses earlier in the Old Testament. I'm going to read them for us uh, so we get a little bit of context. In Judges chapter 5, starting in verse 4, uh, Deborah says, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, same place, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. And then it refers also to Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. Moses says, uh, he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned uh, from Seir, there's that again, upon us, he shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from ten, the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. When Habakkuk uses these place names, he's not just listing off facts. Uh, like, well, he, he came from here, and then he went this way, and then he went this way. Uh, what he's doing is he's drawing us back to these other verses in the Old Testament uh, that reference these same places that talk about God coming in power. When you hear about uh, Mount Paran and, and Taman and Edom uh, and hearing God coming from them, the Israelites, the original readers of the Old Testament would have gone, I know that this means God is about to come in power. That God is about to display His majesty, His splendor, His, His might. This is, by using these places, Habakkuk is setting the stage to discuss God's power and work throughout Israel's history. 
We'll start with God's power. Right? God's power is on display as, as Habakkuk describes God, as his splendor covers the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand. And there he veiled his power. He, he, he kept some of it back. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. Uh, the, the event of the Exodus in the Old Testament is the, the pivotal event of all of the Old Testament. Uh, so you see it referenced and alluded to all throughout these books. And this plague and pestilence are, are, are part of that. Uh, we know the story of the ten plagues uh, that are brought down on the Egyptians by the hand of God as God redeems his people, as he brings them out of, of slavery. This, these, this use here in verse 5, pestilence and plague, is supposed to draw us back to this ability of, for God to b- redeem his people, to pull them out. His power. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. God is a powerful God. He is not just some grandfatherly figure in the sky who grants our wishes and requests. God has fear-making power. Look also at Habakkuk's use of God's power or demonstration of God's power in nature. It says that uh, when the mountains see God, they scatter and they writhe. The everlasting hills sank low, the earth is split with rivers, the sun and the moon stood still. He tramples over the seas. Right? For us, nature still holds some mystery, some vastness. Um, imagine being uh, stuck in the jungle or, or, or look down when you're in a plane and, and flying over uh, just massive plots of land across our country. Like nature is a, is a, is a huge thing to wrap our brain around. And for God, he can change it like he's molding Plato. Like it, is, it is nothing for him to, to look at nature as, as something small, something he created. It says that God stands and measures the earth and he can shake the nations. When I, when I hear that God stands and measures the earth, I, I picture him standing outside of our globe, uh, with one of those tape measures, uh, like, like, like a tailor would use to get your measurements for, uh, for clothes. And God just kind of wraps it around, real easy, around our world and, and can measure it. That's how, how big God is. Our God is powerful. He's mighty. He is not silent and He is, is not passive. God is powerful, but God also works uh, we've got God's works are on display here in Habakkuk 3. God is described as this divine warrior. In verse 8, there's a, there's a bit of a change, um, and, and it becomes a new section, uh, because Habakkuk starts to use, I, I know it's an English lesson, and you're going to hate it, uh, but Habakkuk starts to use second person pronouns, which is just a fancy word for you. Instead of Habakkuk going, I did this, and I did this, and I saw this, and he did that, now he says, your wrath, and your anger, and your indignation, and you rode, and your chariot. He's now talking to God instead of about God. And as Habakkuk is speaking to God, he's speaking to God about God's acts, about what God has done. God acts as a warrior for his people. He crushes nations. He crushes the head of the house of the wicked. He pierces the heads of the opposing warriors. We see this language of God fighting and and winning. You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger, pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. You trampled the sea with your horses. God is this mighty uh, warrior, this, this fighting and winning victor. God's works are always in service of victory. But what kind of victory? Not just battle for battle's sake, or fighting for violence's sake. But verse 13 is Habakkuk's point in talking about God's works and God's uh, abilities and God's power. This verse 13, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. God acts for the salvation of his people. God acts for the victory of his people. 
the redemption of his people. He will remember the covenant he made with them. This is why Habakkuk addresses God as Yahweh at the beginning. He's saying that you are the one who has made this covenant with us and ultimately you're the one who's going to keep this covenant with us. You will not forget us. God does not ignore wrongdoing or ultimately allow oppression. God fights his people's battles. God destroys his, his people's enemies. He goes out for the salvation of his people. And this gives Habakkuk great faith, as we'll see in a bit. But notice one more thing. In verse 13, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. And then he uses this phrase, you crushed the head of the house of the wicked. It's not just a violent picture. Um, it's, it's not just a, a fighting style that God is going to use. Uh, crushing the head brings us back to Genesis 3. When, when the serpent tempts Adam and Eve um, and they fall into sin and, and God comes down and, and brings uh, the curses on the serpent, on Adam, and on Eve, he gives a promise to Eve uh, that one day the seed of Eve uh, will come and crush the head of the seed of the serpent. When God crushes the head uh, of his enemies, um, he's, not just, he's not just being violent for violence' sake. He's fulfilling a promise he made thousands of years ago. A promise to save his people. A promise to redeem his people. And a promise ultimately to bring them back to him. Habakkuk's psalm leads uh, to his resolve at the end of the book. But it first must lead us to examine our own selves. Habakkuk sees God, especially in the account of the Exodus that he, he references a few times in here. He, he, is, he is seeing God and what God has done, and he stands in awe. And I think some of this is lost uh, in our current time. Right? We, Habakkuk has uh, just a small fraction of the Old Testament of what God has done. We have all of it. We have all of the revelation of God that God has given to us. And yet, we, we still grow bored with God. We're looking for, uh, for something novel, for something new, for something exciting. And we miss the, the might and the power of God that is throughout His Word that He's given to us. In fact, the, the God of Scripture is the same today as He was back then. And in verse 6, Habakkuk says this, He stood and measured the earth, He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. God doesn't change. The God in Habakkuk is the same God that we worship today. We have grown bored with God. And every church and every believer needs a healthy fear of God when we see His power and His works and we stand in awe. We need worship that draws us to see God, not songs that appease our preferences. We need sermons that, that point us to Him, not, not TED Talks short on the Bible, but high on morality and things to do, five ways to live a better life, right? We need friends who aren't around just to talk about politics and sports and, and whatever it is, but, but about our God to point us to the majesty and the power of the God that we worship, lest we become a people who are content to go about our lives as if the God of the universe doesn't exist. Now, we would never come in and, and, and claim atheism. Now, we just don't believe that, that God uh, exists. We, we would never claim that, but we can be guilty of, of functional atheism, of living and going through our routine and showing up on a Sunday morning and doing what we're supposed to do and never being affected by the fact that there is a God, that He does love us, that He is there working among us. Let the words of Habakkuk 3 dwell in you as you focus on your God. Let them affect every aspect of your life as you seek to worship Him in everything that you do. Let them populate your prayers and your praise. Let them draw you to more of Scripture as you, you search for more and more about this God. Don't hear this as uh, one more, well, I've, I've heard this already. Let's, let's move on so we can get to green bamboo. All right, let's, let's focus and draw our eyes to the Lord or if you go somewhere else for lunch. Green bamboo is pretty good. But let's focus on who God is and what God has done. Elizabeth Barrett Browning writes, Earth's crammed with heaven. 
and every common bush of fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. God, are we, are we living... Uh, as, are we living knowing that God is active and present in our world? Or are we just rolling through a routine week after week after week? Stand in awe of the presence of God. As Habakkuk finishes out his book and, and this psalm, he, he moves from praising God for his work and, and praising God for his power to an assertion of faith. And the character and, and work of God provide a foundation for that faith of Habakkuk. So we can look to Habakkuk's example As we rest in confident faith, let's read, let's finish it out here, starting in verse 16. Habakkuk writes, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. This transition in, in verse 16 uh, Habakkuk has been talking for the last several verses, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this to God. And then he says, I hear all of this, my body trembles. Talked about this fear of God, this, this standing in awe. My body trembles, my legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. He's writing about his fear of the Lord. He's, he's writing about his, his resignation to, to wait for God. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about waiting for the Lord. We, I mentioned that this is not just a blind waiting, uh, like we're waiting for a bus that may or may not come, but this is confidence and, and hopefulness in the Lord who always delivers. As Habakkuk waits, he knows God is going to keep his promises. He has no doubt. He knows that God is going to do what he said he would do. So who's going to wait? I'm going to quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who have invaded us. He's waiting for God to to answer his petition to judge the Babylonians as they come in and judge the Israelites. And then after that statement of waiting, Habakkuk gives uh, one of the most figurative, uh, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, sections on faith. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk writes about uh, this fig tree not blossoming, this fruit not being on, on the vines, this olive produce failing, and fields being dry and having no food, flocks being cut off, no herd in the stalls. And if you, if you know, the, the people of Judah, they have a farming economy. So if none of this happens, uh, they're in trouble. Disaster is about to strike. There's going to be no food for the people. This is their livelihood. This is their whole lives. It is this fig tree, this fruit on the vines, this olive produce, their, their, their flock and their herds. And Habakkuk says, if all of that fails, yet I will Rejoice in the Lord. Despite all of this, Habakkuk is, is going to put his faith in the Lord because the Lord is worthy of his faith. Faith can be put in, in God in levels of national prominence, like the incoming invasion of the Babylonians for the Israelites. That is a national thing that they are worried about as a nation. And it can be, we can put our faith in God in the smallest of personal matters. In the midst of doubt, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of suffering, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk has already said, I'm going to quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. He's waiting for God to bring judgment down on the Babylonians, but his rejoicing is not in the fact that God uh, is going to give it to those uh, who have it coming to them. His joy is in the fact that his God saves. His God is there. His God is his strength. Makes my feet like the deer's. Makes me tread on my high places. His faith is in a God who has power and ability. And a God that saves. 
God still works for the redemption and salvation of his people. This is the basis of Habakkuk's joy. God is his strength and leads him to salvation. All right, this, is, this is worth rejoicing over for Habakkuk and for us because God still works the same way today. It is the basis of our joy as well. That God saves, that God delivers, that God redeems, and that he has yet to stop. And we have nothing if we don't have salvation from the Lord. A couple weeks ago, we, we came together for, for Gary Williams' funeral in here. And Nikki and I were sitting in a normal spot over there because we're good Baptists who sit in the same pew every week. Uh, the, the, the casket was here in front of the, um, the podium and the, the steps, and the family was sitting on that front pew. And at one point during the service, I mean, if you were here, it was, it was packed, a ton of people here, um, people standing in the foyer and along the back wall. Um, we talked, like, what a, what a testament to the faith that, that Gary had and, and demonstrated. Uh, but at one point in the service, Ken Jewell is up here playing the guitar and, and leading us in Because He Lives. Um, and he's singing, um, and, and we're all kind of singing along, uh, and Nikki nudges me, h- hits me with her elbow, um, and points over, and we look over, and Regina is sitting on the, on the front pew, um, hand raised uh, at her husband's funeral, um, singing because he lives, uh, worshiping the Lord and Savior uh, for her salvation, and the salvation of her husband, who is now in the presence of him. If that is not a picture of Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, that the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail. The fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold. There, there be no herd in the stalls. Um, a loved one passes away. I've, I've lost my job. Um, someone I love is sick. Um, I've lost a house. I've lost my health. I've lost my finances. No matter what it is, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy and the God of my salvation. Habakkuk is, has been and will be stripped of all that he holds dear, except this covenant with God, except this promise that God will save him, that God will redeem him. And that may happen to us. Now, we don't have assurance that everything is going to always go well. In fact, we have assurance that it, it, it's probably the opposite. We may lose jobs, we may lose houses and and spouses and family members and health and finances and and anything else you can name that, that you hold dear. We may lose all of that, but this is the theme of Habakkuk all the way through the book. Confident faith in our God in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of difficulty. Why? Because he continues to save and he will ultimately save us. There will be a time one day when we no longer live in this broken world. We're no longer facing the the struggles, the brokenness of sin and disease and destruction and the effects of all of that. And we will be taken to live with God forever, eternally, without disease, without destruction, without sin, without death, without pain. And that's what we live for. We live for this time when God takes us home. This is the promise that Habakkuk has. The Babylonians will probably end up killing Habakkuk. It's just, that's just what's going to happen. And he knows this. He knows they're a cruel and evil people. And yet he looks back at God and says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He has built us a case, Habakkuk has, for why we can have this faith in our God. And then he gives us the example. You, you, you can have this faith because our God is able to deliver Our God is powerful, our God is mighty, our God is good, our God is loving. You can have this faith because of who God is. And then he gives us this example. As you go through difficulties in life, as you go through times of lack, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So for us, right, will we follow Habakkuk's example? And will we place our faith in this great God? no matter what the, the situation calls for. The last four weeks in Habakkuk have been a, a timely study considering the, the events among our church today. Right? We, we have looked at what it means to lament, what it means to cry out to God, and, and how the Bible gives us language for that. We've studied the nature of faith and, and how waiting for the Lord is uncomfortable, but it's needed. We have been warned of avoiding evil, and then we've been assured that we have a God who fights for us. Who is this divine warrior who is good and mighty and powerful? 
assurance in the Christian faith is not kept hidden from believers. It's not like we, 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 we can go through this life kind of rolling the dice like, man, I hope I've been 51% good. And when I go back, uh, when, when God takes me home, that he's like, well, hopefully he's just done enough good to outweigh the bad. Uh, the Christian life is, is that of grace. Is that of the free gift that, that God has offered to us that gives us salvation and forgiveness of our sin. We will turn and repent, to, or repent and turn to Him. Assurance is not kept hidden from believers. We have many instances where God assures us that we are His and He is ours. And Habakkuk is one of those instances. I hope over the last four weeks you have uh, seen a, a, a picture of God through Habakkuk that encourages you in your faith. It encourages you um, to, to hold on tightly to Him. If you have given your life to Christ, if you have surrendered your life to Him and are a believer, be assured of your faith even as times get difficult because they will if they aren't already. Be assured of the God who holds on to you. Be assured of the God who won't let you go and who will continue to, to pursue you and hold on to you. If you have not given your life to Christ, the God of the universe is offering this, this free gift to you today through His Son. If you will turn and repent and surrender your life to Him. For those, don't let another moment pass. Come join the rest of us uh, as we stand in awe of our God with, a, with full and confident faith. Let's pray. God, we thank you for gathering us here this morning. We thank you for your word and the reminder uh, that you have not left us, uh, that you are powerful, that you are not a weak God or a silent God, uh, but that, that you are powerful and mighty and good and with us and that you work for us. God, we thank you that you have sent your son for us and that we can have salvation through him. God, I pray for those in here who are, are dealing with um, struggles where their fig tree is not, is not blossoming. God, I pray that they would find their joy in you, that they would rejoice in the God of their salvation. God, I thank you for the reminder. I thank you for the encouragement. I pray that you will continue to draw us near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads.